Hey everyone. In this episode, I sat down and had a conversation with Dr. Gregory Sadler. Uh, if you're at all familiar with searching for philosophical concepts or figures on YouTube, then you've probably seen Dr. Sadler's channel come up uh, for any number of topics. He's to date created over 1,700 online videos about philosophy. Uh, those videos have been viewed something like nine and a half million times. Um, in addition to this online work, he's also been quite active as a uh, academic publishing papers. He's the author of a book, dozens of articles, chapters, encyclopedia entries, and other online essays. He's been teaching at university for over 21 years. Uh, and he's also the president of Reason IO, which is a philosophical consulting company through which he gives public lectures, online classes, tutorials, uh, and even philosophical counseling sessions. So I wanted to talk with uh, Dr. Sadler about the intersection of all of these things, both his uh, work online, why he made the decision to start posting videos to YouTube, start posting these lectures over 10 years ago when basically nobody was using the format to, the, to do this kind of thing, and uh, to talk to him about the state of the university system today. Um, I wanted to talk to him right now because one of his lecture series that he just posted is actually on the philosophy of Pierre Hadot and Pierre Hadot's notion of philosophy as a way of life, which is, as many of you know, an important concept uh, that, that points to an important set of practices that are deeply embedded in the sort of the side view ethos of uh, philosophy and transformations of perception. So I wanted to talk to him both about um, his experience making these lectures online, um, you know, the the widespread uh, number of times they've been viewed and listened to, uh, but also this larger conversation around what's going on in universities today, what's happening with this sense of philosophy as a way of life in uh, the context of the university system. Have we strayed away from the kind of the original conception of philosophy as spiritual or existential exercise. Can those exercises survive in some context in universities today? If so, where is that happening? I ask him all of these questions and more. So if you're interested in these things, and I think if you're at all philosophically minded, these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves today uh, and coming up with uh, not just good accounts of what's happening and what's happened to philosophy in the university, but what we can do about it. And I think, you know, rather than just have a kind of critical engagement with uh, academic philosophy today, we kind of look into the places where Hado's criticism makes sense, where it doesn't make sense, uh, what's a sort of a fair telling of that story in a kind of a more complex and detailed way. And then again, um, what are some of the things that we could be doing to make the situation better? So if those are things that interest you, um, I hope you like this episode. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sadler. Um, I was thinking maybe we could just start with just a little bit more background from you and how you, just basically how you landed where you are today. You're a fairly early adopter in creating these philosophical lectures online and you know, just using the online space as a kind of philosophical medium. What made you head in, in that direction when you did? You know, I know you have this traditional background and upbringing, but you made a different move than other people made. What, what was that first move about for you? So if we're talking about the YouTube stuff, um, my wife played a major role in it. Uh, at that time, fiance, she's, she's a really early adapter and I'm much more of a, you know, conservative curmudgeon not conservative politically but in terms of like adopting things you know i'm i know that's not going to work sort of person and she had gotten me a flip cam back when there was actually a company called flip and it was like one of the early handheld uh cameras you could just plug into your computer and download the video files and so she'd gotten me that for a trip that i i went on with my kids and then she suggested I should do lecture capture in the classroom. And it was my last semester at Fayetteville State University where I um, had been teaching for the, you know, 
about three years, I was moving up to New York to, to be with her. Um, and so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'll give it, give it a shot. And back then YouTube didn't let you upload very long videos as an individual. So all of those critical thinking class videos are in Fayetteville State University's, um, their, their channel. I, I don't actually own them. And I was really surprised. I, all I did was like plunk down the camera and then hit record for the first class of the day. I was teaching like four, se four sections of critical thinking, one right after another each day mm -hmm. with like a one hour break for lunch in there. And so I, um, you know, we started uploading these and then people started watching them all over the world. And I, I was pretty astounded. And again, you know, my wife, Andy, she was sort of a, you know, she, she's the one who had all, all the faith at first. She was like, just put it out there and see what happens. And I was like, well, who's going to watch me? You know, I'm, I'm a nobody at some small school. Uh, but it turned out that there were a lot of people who benefited from them. And one class of people were, were they, they'd all leave comments. And so one class were the people who said, my professor won't actually teach the material and you're helping me out by going over this stuff. And I was astounded to see, I mean, I knew there were some bad teachers out there, but I was astounded to see just how many of them there, there actually were. So there was that whole class. And then there were a bunch of people who were saying things like, you know, I, I really appreciate you putting these, these videos online because I can't afford to go to college or, you know, my life situation doesn't, doesn't allow me to do that. So, or I was in college and I, I'd like to go back, but I can't. So um, this is like being in a college classroom. And then, you know, there were other people as well, lifelong learners and, and other people who, who said it was, it was a good thing. So then when I moved up to New York and I started teaching at Marist College as an adjunct, they let me uh, video record my classes as well. So I started doing intro to philosophy and ethics. And now it's not just teaching out of a critical thinking textbook. Now it's teaching Plato or teaching Nietzsche or teaching who, whoever else we're going to go over and putting it into my own channel. And uh, it just started taking off and, and people responded to it and they liked it. So, you know, it created kind of a feedback loop. I did more and more of it. And I started putting more work into, you know, um, finding a good quiet classroom to shoot some videos. And then eventually we bought this chalkboard that you see behind me. Uh, that was a good investment. and you know, started investing and you see some of the lighting stuff back there, but it's all been very, um, it's all been done on the cheap and it's all been, you know, one little development after another. And, uh, you know, I never put a lot of effort into making things high production because I thought, you know, the content is really what matters. Mm -hmm. Obviously having, you know, a voice recorder is kind of nice. So the sound quality is a bit better. But um, I mean, this is the camera that I'm still using now, this, this little GoPro. Nice. Um, so you don't, you, know, you don't have to be very sophisticated in order to produce videos that can be useful for people. You just got to you know, kind of know what you're talking about and be able to reach an audience and all those things that we think that most college professors ought to be able to do. So, right. Yeah. Right. And so when were those first videos, the very first one, when did you start posting them? So about 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, um, I did record some of my own stuff in my own channel. The very first videos that I was doing were um, what I called Dr. Sadler chalk and talk videos. Mm -hmm. And that was a way to stick it to the educational experts who were saying, oh, a video can't be any longer than five minutes or people won't watch it. Right. And chalk and talk and lecture is dead. I was like, well, I, I don't think that's that's true. So let's uh, create some, you know, 17 minute videos and see if people will watch them. And, and they did. Right. Yeah, that's been, you know, the, the story that we hear so often is that Internet uh, and social media in particular are shortening attention spans and it needs to be the content needs to be fast and immediate and yeah. kind of in the stream of other people's content. And it, you're constantly getting pushed down, you know, the rankings and the, do you, in the do you algorithms. Buy what do you think? Well, so I don't really, I think that's happening. I think that's yeah. obviously one of the things that's happening. And that seems true enough in certain contexts. Yeah, yeah. But, I think that's the key thing right there. It's not but, a universal truth. No, but like we have all of these other counter examples, like your, your philosophy lectures, you know, having, you know, put, you're putting up some numbers with these videos, you know, more be well beyond what you might just expect from, 
you know, fairly in-depth philosophy lectures. You know, there's popularity there. We also have, you know, the advent of these long form podcasts, people sitting yeah. down to have, you know, longer kind of more nuanced in-depth conversations. Those podcasts are doing bigger numbers than CNN and M MSNBC. Obviously not all of them, but the, the major ones are overtaking traditional media just in terms of numbers. Netflix is doing these like, you know, long, essentially like 10, 20 hour movies. So yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot that's happening. That's not just uh, captured by that sort of soundbite narrative, attention spans are dwindling narrative. And I think what you're doing is there's a part of that. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that I asked you on here was um, I, I had started watching your uh, recent series on Pierre Hadot. Um, my listeners will know that Pierre Hadot has been a huge influence on me philosophically, a big influence on the side view project in general, just that attitude. Um, and so I thought that that was, you know, sort of the perfect opportunity to reach out to you and have this discussion. You mentioned just now talking about you know, encountering these people online who are coming to you for not just, you know, learning about philosophy, but to get something more out of the classes they were already taken, taking, yeah. you know, yeah. and Hado um, has some, you know, pretty pronounced criticisms on academic modern philosophy, philosophy yeah. academic philosophy in the university. Um, you know, the professionalization of philosophy, what he sometimes calls discourses about philosophy, sort of implying that what these people are doing isn't actually philosophy. It's a kind of like a, a sort of a textbook rehashing of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. theoretical concepts, uh, uh, you know, propositional statements that can be memorized and placed into a system, things like that. He's talking about philosophy as a way of life. And this was, you know, a big part of your, that, as I mentioned, that lecture series on Hado that you've recently done. And I think that conception that he has obviously feeds into his view of um, how philosophy is taught in modern universities. So I definitely want to talk about um, your thoughts on sort of modern pedagogy, the state of the university system. But I think we should start, you know, at the beginning more with Hado's conception of philosophy so that we can yeah. maybe see why the modern university system is struggling with it a little bit. So yeah. can I can I ask you, um, can we sort of flesh out, let's flesh out some of Hado's main concepts. He says the, the ancient Greek system, um, philosophy was treated as a way of life. What, what does that mean? What, what, oh. did, what did he mean by saying that? I know there's a lot to that question, yeah. but I think that um, there's a few pieces there that I think um, for listeners who, who don't read Hado and who, who maybe don't know about that period in philosophy as well, um, it's quite different from the university system of philosophy. So maybe we can just start with just, just a few sort of key themes that might differentiate those two things. Yeah, I, I mean, one of them <clears throat> right, right off the bat is that idea that um, philosophy is something meant to be lived, applied within the context of a life, not just compartmentalized into what you do while you're at the university, while you're teaching your class. You know, As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll use an example of one of my uh, former professors who was a really great teacher, um, but didn't get tenure. And it was at Southern Illinois University. And the reason was is because you know Southern Illinois University is in Carbondale, out in the middle of effectively you know what to most people it's nowhere, right? I mean, I liked it quite a bit, but I'm I'm from Wisconsin, uh, and I grew up in the countryside, so that was cool for me. And I know you can do philosophy anywhere, but this guy lived in St. Louis because he was you know he was uh, from more of a cosmopolitan background, and so he would commute back and forth from St. Louis to Carbondale, which is a two and a half hour drive, and he'd do it a couple times a week, you know. Uh, SIU was a research university, so he only had to teach two classes per semester. And the reason he didn't get tenure is because he didn't do a lot of writing his first few years. Instead, he lived this totally compartmentalized life where he was doing philosophy while he was at the university. And then he'd go home and he would, you know, um, make his food and he was into rowing and, you know, did all the things that, that he did, dated people. And he had this bifurcated life. 
that's possible within a contemporary academic setting. Or, you know, I'll mention some of my other colleagues who go, who work at another university. And I asked if they knew each other and they said, no, no, we, we don't, um, you know, we all come in at different times, different schedules. We never meet each other. And I was just astounded by Mm -hmm. that. It's a school in New York city. So kind of makes sense. So that's totally antithetical to philosophy as a way of life. You know, you, if you're, if you're studying ancient philosophy in the, the framework of, of philosophy as a way of life, you're starting to apply it to your, your life. And it's not just the, for, Had, for Hado, it's not just, you know, the Epicureans or the Stoics or the Cynics who are doing this, where there's definitely a heavy practical aspect. He even says that the, the Platonists and the Aristotelians are doing this as well, which, which is one claim where uh, some of his critics would, would disagree. Like John Sellers says, yeah, I'm not quite so sure about that, you know? And I, and I think there's, there's a tension there. Um, but the, the idea is that you, you have to be living out what you're doing. And there are practical implications, even to things that seem to be just intellectual um, arguments or distinctions, you know, and, and I was always attracted to this because, you know, I'm a first generation college student. I got into philosophy without the idea that it was going to be some, you know, game that we played. And I, I, I always thought it was going to be something that we could apply. You know, I thought that with all my classes, mm-hmm. silly me, you know, um, and then, you know, you run into a lot of professors for whom that's not the case. And, and you can say well, there, there's like a performative contradiction there. So I'd say that's one really key idea. Another, you know, we're going to talk about spiritual exercises. That's what uh, Doe likes to call them. Um, you know, there's other words that we can use for this. If you're doing tradition constituted inquiry, like McIntyre and stuff, you call these practices. Um, there's all sorts of other ways of, of framing this common idea, which is that you've got a whole range of things that you do deliberately choosing to exercise whatever you want to call it, your faculty of choice, the will, uh, you're directing yourself in certain ways to work on yourself. I mean, this is where Foucault gets this, you know, I like the phrase technology is the self. It's kind of a cool thing. I don't think we have to necessarily just buy into his take on it. Right. I think these are sort of common properties. Um, And then, you know, what else? Um, I mean, if we, if we're thinking about like, how decisions get made about what counts as important in contemporary academic philosophy. There's, there's a very stratified prestige system, I would say, that extends not just through teaching and hiring, but also through publications. And, you know, it's not like people at the elite universities are stupid or anything, but they're not any smarter than the rest of us. And they, they're just better connected. Um, and they've got the same proportion of, you know, people who can't teach effectively and people who can, or people who aren't very intellectually curious and people who, mm-hmm. who, who are, and, um, but they, you know, it's all very prestige laden and there's all these assumptions that go into academic philosophy, like our ideal delivery system, 15 week semester. I mean, <laughs> well, that's, that's insane. Right? Right. The idea that we have to pack everything into the, and we never actually get 15 weeks. We always get like closer to 13 or 14 with all the weird breaks and stuff. Um, the idea that, that that's how we should package Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics or an introduction to philosophy class or pick whatever else you want, you know, the Stoics teaching a class on, on them, or as I'm teaching right now, philosophy is a way of life uh, at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. That's what I shot the Ado videos for. The notion that everything has to be in these little boxes Mm-hmm. is really kind of kind of silly, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and philosophy as a way of life in the past, they, in some respect, made the, the study fit the material. So maybe you would, you know, like take the Neoplatonists that, that uh, Ado is interested in. You would study Plato's dialogues. And there wasn't a set thing like, okay, now we're going to work on this dialogue for seven sessions. And after that, we're done with it, right? It was, do you understand the stuff? Have you been able to make sense of it? If not, well, we have to extend it further and you don't get to read the next dialogue until you've, you've progressed through that. Or if you've got it down already, maybe we only need three sessions. So I, I'd say those are some big differences. There is one other thing I'd like to say too. Um, you know, Ado is not saying something radically new even in the 20th century in French philosophy. Maurice Blondel, 
Gabriel Marcel, you know, the existentialist that Ado talks about as exemplifying philosophy as a way of life. They, the Bergson, they, they were all doing that as well. Ado just had a really great catchphrase. And then he, you know, he, he kind of um, you know, set it up for ancient philosophy, how you could, how you could read them in ways that would, would um, get you away from this overly intellectualist. Uh, manner of, of interpreting them, you know, where you could see like maybe Plotinus could actually have something to say to you and how you're living your life right, you know? Sure, sure. So there's a few different sort of categories of things that you just laid out there. One of them sounds, one of them sounds kind of, you know, broadly political, bureaucratic, uh, so- sociological maybe that there's a, you know, we have this sort of big machine of an institutional education system. <laughs> yeah, you just keep cranking it out. It's just, yeah, it's, you know, it's got gears. It's this very modern yeah, yeah. kind of industrial thing. Um, and that, and, you know, you get the sort of the, the assembly line metaphors and, you know, the 15 week slots and uh, yeah. every topic is the same as every other topic. And, you know, there's just like this delivery system and we want efficiency and uniformity and then metrics and standards and all these things. That seems like one sort of, uh, set of criteria here. The other thing that you mentioned on that I want to zoom in a little bit uh, more right now is, is this question of, of spiritual exercise or oh, yeah. uh, ascesis or ascesis, um, you know, the root of our word asceticism, but is a little bit different from, you know, sort of simply abstinence or privation and things like that. Yeah. Um, because that, that kind of gets more into, uh, I want to say content or pedagogy or you know, style of teaching um, and when Hado talks about these things, he lists several different kinds of exercise. And it seems like yeah. some of them are there, if, or at least, you know, as you're saying, if you're teaching them well, they're present in the university system. Things like uh, close reading and research and critical thinking and writing and, you know, maybe even kinds of self-examination and things like that. Uh, maybe clear speech, like this kind of stuff. That seems there, or at least it translates into that system fairly easy. Some of the other exercises, um, you know, like fasting, meditation, contemplative yeah. exercise, you know, he talks about like platonic, you know, theoria and, you know, b- theoria in the sense of, you know, beholding a, like a sort of beatific vision that, that transforms your perception of things or, you know, creates a metamorphosis. When he goes in that direction, I kind of have to say, okay, that's, those things aren't that common in, yeah. in university settings. Um, and if those things are, in fact, sort of primary or as important as sort of propositional, conceptual, you know, logical understanding, then there's a big, there's a big problem even with the teaching. Um, and yeah. so I'm wondering, I had um, um, Ryan Duns. Do you know Ryan Duns? No, I don't. He's at a, so he's a Jesuit at Marquette. Um, and I just I just had a conversation with him a few weeks ago where uh, he was talking about reintroducing contemplative practice like into his pedagogy. So he'd actually have his students sit and and meditate each each class, you know. So there's yeah. there's things like that that um, don't seem present, but maybe could be. And so I'm wondering when Hado says, um, you know, he he lifts this quote from from Henry Thoreau. Uh, nowadays, there are philosophy professors, but no philosophers. You know, I kind of think he means something like this, that there are people who teach these things, but they're not necessarily practicing the um, this other side of of the spiritual exercises. Yeah, and I will come back to that, but I would like to say we can even intensify that that statement, you know, there's there's philosophers, there's people who teach philosophy, and then there's placeholders who do something that's tangentially connected to philosophy, but isn't really that, that effectively connected to it. I would say a lot of the people who are occupying uh, positions as academic philosophers where they're teaching are not teaching anything remotely like genuine philosophy. They're mm-hmm. teaching things that we sociologically categorize as philosophy. And I'd say a lot of analytic philosophy and quite a bit of continental philosophy falls into that sort of stuff where, um, you know, it, it, and this is where I think teaching history of philosophy is actually better than than trying to just you know look at the latest five articles on this particular question or something like that. 
you know, you don't necessarily have to be teaching philosophy as a way of life in the classroom to be able to open up doors to students that are going to turn out to be quite vital because, you know, you could be doing history of philosophy quite well and then saying, you might go and do this sort of thing on your own and try it out. And then students can do that. But if all you're doing is, you know, looking at the latest critique of this or that, you know, you're chasing after the shiny objects, you might say, or, or sticking to the, your, your comfort zone, because that's all, sometimes in some cases, that's all you were trained to do. Um, I would say that's, that's, you know, philosophy, you know, whatever we want to, want to call it, you know, philosophoid or uh, we'd have to come up with a new word for something where they're not even doing history of philosophy well. They're not even teaching about philosophy well. Mm. Um, actually, I'll, if you wouldn't mind, I'll, I'll go on one other sure. tangent. Um, you know, there, the, the idea of doing an intro to philosophy class or an ethics class um, in a 15-week period, it's not without any usefulness altogether. I mean, obviously, you can't teach even like a, a tiny proportion of what's out there, right? So you can't effectively introduce students to philosophy in a truly meaningful sense. Um, but it's a, it's a class that everybody who's doing philosophy ought to teach because it's so hard to teach well. Mm. And, and you ought to teach it not just to people who are going to be philosophy majors, but people who are definitely not going to do philosophy. They're going to be comm majors or fashion majors or business majors or stuff like that. Because that's the crucible in which good philosophy teaching and a lot of thinking gets gets forged you know it's super easy to teach graduate students they do most of the work for you you know you just kind of point them in the right direction it's easy to teach majors at a, at a you know elite university because they're already doing all that work for you because they want to impress you you know mm -hmm. teaching the people who are like who is this guy and what's this garbage he's going to teach us and why is this worth my time teaching them effectively that's that's where the real action is you know and and you know you can't do everything you want to do in the 15 week format. Obviously you, you, any, any new person you bring in, you got to throw somebody out. Um, but it, it is a useful exercise and, and you can do that with philosophy as a way of life. I, you know, I'm teaching that at Milwaukee Institute of art and design this semester. And, you know, we can't teach all of it obviously in a semester, right. uh, but you know, you can, you can uh, focus on some of the main things. Right. So we can do the Epicureans and the cynics and, and the Stoics and talk about Buddhism a bit and do some comparative work. Mm -hmm. um, you can you know, you, you can do this stuff within an academic framework. You just can't do it in, you know, you can't do it in the same sense that Ado is, is signaling. Right? right. Where it would be something you go on and do in addition to that. But you could like make. I don't want to say make converts because it's not like converting somebody to a, a cult or anything, but you can, I'll use that metaphor. You can open a lot of doors for them and say, take a look through here. Isn't there something on the other side that could be interesting to you? Um, and you don't even have to like, you know, give them a push through the door. They'll, they'll go on themselves. Some of them mm -hmm. right. and keep reading and studying. And that maybe that's one way we can think about the relationship between you know, philosophy in the university system versus philosophy as a way of life is that maybe yeah. the, maybe the setup is simply such that um, not only is it kind of impractical and hard to do because of the the sociological aspects, but also maybe it would be a little bit dangerous to do in today's climate because it it does make these sort of demands on you of like spiritual exercises and beliefs and things like that. Things that people would say that oh I don't know this is you know the the university is supposed to be a kind of a new uh, neutral uh, place neutral yeah. place yeah. and um, this is kind of stepping on that a little bit but so maybe one way to think of the relationship would be to just kind of show people those doors and then hope that you know in their own lives they they kind well, of start to engage you do it. as practices the strategy you use is to make it experimental you tell them listen you don't have to believe any of this sort of stuff you're just gonna sort of like you know what what we did with stoic week right with the modern stoicism organization just going to try to live like a stoic for a week. You don't have to believe it. You just, you know, try it out and see whether it makes any difference in your life. And, you know, there's a good reason why these philosophies have been around for so long. They do actually make a difference in people's lives. Yeah. So you're, you're giving them the gateway drug, so to speak, but you're not calling it that you're saying we're going to be experimental and experiential and, uh, you know, you have them like write little reports on how doing this exercise for a week, you know, did or didn't do anything for them. 
and you make them engage in reflection on that, right? Mm -hmm. And talk with each other and and it works. Yeah, so I had this I had this experience and this is one of the reasons that I keep going back and forth in my own view of what Hado is saying, which which was something like um he makes this criticism, and I think we've, we've kind of fleshed it out in a few different ways just now of, of why, why, why that criticism works and uh, yeah. why it's important to pay attention to and why his, his kind of intervention about philosophy as a way of life, what is ancient philosophy, et cetera, is, is important and one to consider. Um, on the other hand, once you kind of get what he's saying and you start to kind of apply it to yourself and you apply it to the way you read other philosophers. Once I kind of yeah. got the Hado fix and that I picked up, you know, Kant or somebody else, somebody who um, I had an image in my head or Descartes, for example. Of yeah, being I was going to say he's of, a perfect example because I had talks about him. Well, right? I had this, I was carrying around this sort of very silly kind of Wikipedia entry of Descartes <laughs> in my head. Um, and then you read it and you're like, how did I miss that he's actually telling you to go through meditative exercises that proceed in this kind of stepwise fashion? And yeah. you have to have certain meditative insights before you proceed into the next phase. Then you start to see, oh, this is Hado's, Hado's perspective is widespread among the sort of the great philosophers that we read. They yeah. didn't forget this. They didn't forget to put it into use. And so then when I look at it and he even, you know, he gives these lists of people for whom the ancient idea of philosophy is still alive. And you end up with, you know, the existentialists, most of the major phenomenologists, the Marxists, you know, like all of these people. And then you kind of go, okay, so if this is gone, but all of the major kind of figures are still using it, can we really say it's, it's gone? It's, That's right. It's, it's, it's not it's, gone. It's not gone. And it's so then, sort of like, you know, the example, you know, we talk about in ethics, the revival of, of virtue ethics in the 20th century, and that's complete BS. The virtue ethics never went away. It was always being taught, you know, in part through the people who are doing ancient philosophy and within Catholic circles. And, you know, there's all these references to it. It was in this very narrow academic, you know, discourse in largely in Britain and the United States where it had gone away. And yeah, you're, 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 you're exactly right. The same thing is, is true of philosophy as a way of life. Right. It never went away. It was always just kind of pushed over to the side. Right. But so I guess, I guess I'm, I'm trying to kind of inquire into or understand better how we should think about that. I, I'm tempted to say it's like, a, it's not esoteric because it's right there. But right. it, it is esoteric in a sense. And maybe that's the kind of the meaning behind some of this esoteric stuff is that it's hidden only if you don't have a kind of like way of looking for things. And then if you do, it's, it's right there and available. Um, I don't want this to sound kind of too mysterious, but um, I'm trying to get at that tension between on the one hand, agreeing with Hado and everything we've just said about what's happening in universities, whilst yeah. also accepting that this is a living tradition that you can step into and be a part of. And that's in some sense, never gone away. Yeah. You know, so there's a weird tension there. Yeah. And I would say that there's a lot of different um, similar projects that are using different vocabulary for this, this same thing. So, you know, we could talk about like Foucault and his interest in the technologies of the self and, and, you know, and Ado, and we can talk about Alistair McIntyre and other people who are focused on looking at it more in an Aristotelian way, uh, tradition constituted rationality. Um, you know, or, or, you know, Martha Nussbaum or John Sellers there, these people are all signaling basically the same stuff. And they're, they're often in disagreement, like, well, who should we turn to? So McIntyre, you know, a long in a great article kind of schooled him on, on how the Stoics are actually exemplifying the kind of, uh, inquiry that, that McIntyre was saying only the Aristotelians were doing. So now we can widen the scope. Um, is it is it esoteric? It's not esoteric in the bad sense of like being part of a mystery initiation and, you know, you got to have all these secrets revealed to you because you're right, they're, they're there in plain sight. Mm -hmm. But we require um, perspective transformations to make that happen. And so part of that is getting away from the way that philosophy gets gets conceptualized and taught within the academy. And part of it really does tie in with the spiritual practices, because by doing things, so I, you know, I use this metaphor with the Stoics. There's, there's a lot of um, 
what I don't call spiritual exercises or philosophical practices where you do them for a while and you, you're kind of uh, changing things for yourself, like climbing to a height. And now you get to a plateau and you can see a lot further. Mm -hmm. So engaging in the process of negative visualization, if you're only doing that because you read about it in some blog post where it's like a little blurb about, you know, stoic practices that are going to be life hacks for you, you're not going to get that much out of it, right? If, you, if you're reading Epictetus at the same time and Seneca and you're doing this thing, suddenly passages within those works open up for you. And that's a normal thing, right? I mean, that is part of basically every hermeneutic tradition, whether it's in the West or in, in other places as well. You have to make a life kind of, you don't have to commit your whole life, right? But you got to commit something. You got to put something on the table, do something, and then understanding comes yeah. with it. And, and it's an iterative process. You do more of it, you know, uh, you understand more. You, you start to figure out, well, why the hell am I doing these stupid practices that somebody's making me do, right? right. Um, and, and so, I, I, you know, it, it's not a, it shouldn't be a secret, but it's just our, you know, kind of screwed up uh, human nature and the society that we live in and the way in which we, we've been talking about, you know, philosophy as academics that makes it a secret for people. Right, right. And so there's a, just to kind of reframe what you just said, there are, sort of transformative pre what requisites mm -hmm. to insight. In other words, it's, it's not right. on some level, if you just think of, if you have this image of philosophy as a series of, you know, sort of propositional claims that lead up to an argument and you, you simply need to understand like the logic or lack thereof yeah. in the claim, and that's the insight, then you're not going to get some of the other things that we're talking right now, which actually require transformation you actually have to yeah. become different in your own sort of being in order to understand what they're talking about or maybe there's you know a, a text means something at that sort of one level of transformation and it means something else at another level and so you right, kind of right, have these yeah. these kind of iterative depths to the conversation and i, I think a lot of people distrust you know they're like well that sounds like it's very arbitrary like i'm getting yeah. initiated into a sect or a cult you know and I'm going to like lose perspective that I ought to have. And, you know, the test for that is, well, okay, jump in, see whether you actually did lose perspective or whether you've got a better, broader perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what I was going to ask you about, you know, your point about doing the practices whilst also reading the texts or, yeah. um, you know, if you're lucky to, to work with a teacher, you know, sort of a philosophical, spiritual director in a way, right? Like where you could set up this conversation in terms of like an opposition between sort of reason and empiricism on the one hand and spiritual exercise and revelation yeah. and transformation on the other. But what's kind of being offered is, is a kind of a, a, a synthesis of those two things. So you're keeping your reason and you're keeping your empirical mindset with you. And the practices are actually things that you can engage in an empirical way and go and check out for yourself. This is, this is the claim being made. Yeah. And so don't take it as it's not, it can sound like an argument from authority or from tradition or something like that. But yeah. in fact, you could read the tradition as just a series of good empirical practices that people have recorded. And the ones that got recorded are the ones that worked. So you could, you could treat the practice itself as a kind of empiricism. That's, that's one criticism I hear I hear from people when you kind of go in this direction, especially since um, so much of philosophy today is conceptualized as kind of the home of reason, yeah, as yeah. a kind of as a kind of a bulwark against uh, you know ideology, propaganda, manipulation, um, yeah, you know all of these other things. You know, it reminds me of William James' uh, criticism of the empiricists that they weren't empirical enough. You know, they don't attend to enough of experience. They, they wind up sort of shoehorning things into categories that fit their models of what counts as, you know, being scientific, which, which by the way, are like, by this point, really outmoded, you know, it's, it's kind of it, studying history is great. Studying the history of ideas is great because you get to see just how, how often motifs get, get, you know, uh, reinterpreted and how what's considered to be cutting edge at one point in time, and if we're not doing this, we're not doing real real work, winds up you know getting thrown out. 
Uh, and James, you know, uh, I always, I, I have my students read that, that essay, The Will to Believe, which I think ties in very well with uh, philosophy mm -hmm. as a way of life, unless you actually, in two ways, unless you actually do make commitments, there's a lot of things you're not going to discover. And you can say that's just as true for James as it is for, you know, Augustine saying, unless you, you know, uh, believe you won't understand, right? Taking that from, from the Septuagint translation of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. But James also talks about um, in cases where we've done our due diligence in terms of, you know, like plotting things out rationally, and we, we don't arrive at a absolute conclusion, we're, we're allowed to use our passional nature or volitional nature, as he calls it, to make the decision for us. That's, that's legitimate. And that's even maybe required in, in some cases, you know. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's all these interesting parallels that can be Right. drawn be, between right. these things. Do you mind uh, speaking a bit to your own practices and your own experiences, how you kind of deploy this sense of philosophy in your own life? Oh, um, I'm kind of a messy guy when it comes to that. <laughs> Not very methodical, you yeah. know. Um, I, you know, I do read a lot. And, and I, I, one of the things I did like about, you know, Ando's philosophy as a way of life is his insistence that reading itself done in certain ways is a spiritual practice. It's not like you've got the reading over here where you like read about the spiritual practices and then you start doing them, which is a dichotomy that a lot of practice oriented people will, will insist, you know, mm -hmm. and I think is, is, is a wrong way of looking at things. Um, a lot of what I'm doing winds up being, um, it, it comes out of the reading. I sort of, as the Stoics like to say, stock up my my um, my head full of all sorts of dogmata, you know, all sorts of useful, um, you could call them arguments, distinctions, passages. And then when I get into a situation, I start applying them. Um, that's not, that's not a, a pursuit that I recommend for a lot of people. I think a lot of people should be more methodical. Um, but I, I spent so much time from my, my teens through my 30s, late 30s, just reading all this stuff that I've, I've got a lot more of it, you know, stocked up to be able to use. Um, so there's that. I, I, do, I do apply some practices pretty regularly. Um, I got into studying Stoicism and also, you know, some of the things that I do with, with Aristotle and Plato and the, those traditions in part to work on anger problems. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I had a lot of struggles. I still do sometimes, but, but nowhere, thank God, nowhere near like what I used to have when I was younger. And I found that there were all these great um, insights and practices that were available in, in these philosophical traditions, right? And so with those, I was a bit more methodical, you know, sometimes journaling or doing things like that. But for the most part, I'm, I'm just sort of like responding on the fly to, to stuff. Um, yeah. I, it's not how I have my students engage with it. I, I'm, you know, I like set out a, not a curriculum as such for them, but so for example, in, in this, this class that I'm teaching, right, this semester, there's a required spiritual practice for the week. So like this week they're doing stoicism and they have to apply every single day in some ways, the, di, you know, the dichotomy of control and what's in our control, what's not right. And then next week, it'll be they'll have to do negative visualization. And I'll give them a couple other spiritual exercises that are optional for them. And then we'll meet on Thursday virtually and we'll talk about how's it going and, you know, do, are you doing it in, in an effective way? Are you not doing it? Um, so there is more of a structured curriculum, right? But that's because they're students. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's more just uh, using the stuff that I've packed up and you know what Descartes calls the thesaurus or the treasure house of the mm -hmm. of the memory mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. which Ado talks about as well right? He, right he says that one of the main purposes of reading is so that your attentiveness and your ascetic practices can be carried out effectively so you've right. got material there you know yeah I mean I've I've observed in myself just you know having some experience doing you know kind of meditative practice and also yeah. trying to do uh, close readings of philosophical texts, you know, slow, close readings that yeah. those, those two things are actually very similar in that, you know, when, when you're doing many kinds of meditation, the goal is often not kind of get attached to 
all of the many thoughts and distractions that start to emerge in the process of, of meditating. You're supposed to kind of disengage from that and let all of those yeah. things go. And you, ha I have the same experience when I'm reading where, especially if it's a challenging text, my thoughts kind of want to go other places. And so the yeah. task kind of becomes the same kind of focused attention. And so to me, I totally get that um, they're they're training the same um, quality of attention, you could say, and that quality of attention has to be there in order for yeah, the texts yeah. to kind of open up, and that requires, you know, Hado says that the the texts are about forming, not informing. In other words, there's something happening. You know, you say you have this storehouse of of concepts and ideas and phrases, but I think. I think what they're saying is that 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 kind of re those those phrases are there because they work in very specific situations and you kind of make them part of your action and perception yeah. by reading them over right so that's I think that's yeah. the forming the forming part yeah and and for me um they're sort of like connected like a network um mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of people who are like you know what's the one key idea of stoicism well there isn't one key idea you know, if there was, then it wouldn't be a philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, instead, there's a whole bunch of interconnected ideas. And, and like by studying one of them, you might actually better understand another one over here, you know. Um, and and the, the other thing I'll say, too, um, nobody has to be perfect at this, this sort of thing. You know, it, you, you can it, it is something that we accumulate. Right. Uh, we build upon. And they're, they're, even for somebody, I mean, you read about this, even for somebody who's like close to the end of their life and they've been studying a particular mode of philosophy and applying it, they can be like, holy crap, I've been wrong about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to do things this way, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. As you were kind of describing your own mix of practices, I was reminded that in Hado's What is Ancient Philosophy, he, he opens, I mean, he's got maybe a dozen sort of framing quotes from, you know, various sort of philosophical figures in the, in the beginning of the text. And one of them is from Nietzsche, where he says, the results of all the schools and of all of their experiments belong legitimately to us. We will not hesitate to adopt a stoic formula on the pretext that we have previously profited from Epicurean formulas. You know, so there's that sense there yeah. that we have these traditions and there's probably there's probably an important balance there between kind of devotion to the tradition and eclecticism or having that kind of flexibility to move between them. Yeah, but I yeah. think that, you know, if you're talking about something like philosophy, that whole history and tradition, and, you know, here we're only talking about, you know, a kind of a narrow band of Western European philosophers, but certainly this would apply to, you know, the world over. Mm -hmm. But there is, there is a, there's quite a lot to draw from there. And we're, maybe this actually is a good place to pivot into um, talking about the internet and what possibilities are available there because we have access to so much now. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's so much available, you know, just we, we can get the texts and we can get the translations and we can get, you know, the encyclopedia entries and, you know, we can go online and go to these research databases and pull, pull a dozen articles on a book, you know, just like that. And then, you know, I can go watch your YouTube lectures. I can go on Twitter. I can go, you know, in many cases, I've had the experience where I've gotten a new book. I've started reading it and I'll just, I'll just DM the author because the author's also on Twitter and then we'll have a little exchange. You know, this is yeah. unprecedented. This is, this is wild. And, you know, for, for those of us who are, you know, moving in those spaces, it's, it's really exciting. And likewise, if you're trying to create philosophy or write, write philosophically and share it with people, you can do that fairly easily. You know, you, you can put, you can create a blog. It's free. The barrier to entry is very low. Yeah, so yeah. there's, there's all these huge advantages, right? And at the same time, the internet is kind of a giant mess. And a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that happens uh, yeah. online, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to speak negatively about, you know, just like young people who haven't studied philosophy, just like getting online and, you know, posting that they've, you know, kind of solved the mystery of life or whatever, but there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of bad reading. So it's definitely like a, a double-edged sword, um, but you've been in that game for, you know, quite a while and you've made it work for you. So what is that, 
if you're just thinking about like philosophy as a way of life in this way we've been discussing, how does that live on the internet? Like, does does the internet make it more possible, or what are the strengths and weaknesses there? Yeah, um, it's definitely opened up access and connection to people in ways that I think are very positive. E even the fact that you know adding the fact that you can have negative interactions with trolls and stuff like that. Even, even with that, you know, like you said, you can DM an author. Um, there's this possibility of, of interaction with, with people, you know, like I'll, I'll do um, one, one of my streaming things I do every month that I did yesterday is this political theory and, and practice discussion thing. And it, it's me talking, but I'm responding to all the comments and questions that people are having on the side after I've done my, you know, like 20 minute shtick about in this case, Hobbes, you know, next, next time it's going to be Aristotle on slavery. And that that's probably going to be kind of an incendiary one, um, given the, the many different takes that people have, but you know, that, that almost direct contact that's mediated through these digital formats, like you and me right now talking and seeing each other, um, you know, and, and being able to record this, uh, 30 years ago, this, this really wasn't much of a possibility. You could have called me on the phone. You could have had a recorder right there, right? right. Uh, there might've been something more sophisticated. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, there's, there's that whole aspect. You're right. There's all this content that's available. Curating it is sometimes a challenge. Um, I get a lot of people writing me questions in YouTube comments that show that they're not using um, the basic stuff that YouTube provides like playlists or the search function to, to figure out where to, where to get stuff. Cause they'll be like, do you have a video on this? And I'll be like, got a whole playlist, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so clearly there's there, we could use more information literacy when it comes to that, you know? Um, and it's, it's kind of tough sometimes to get at a lot of the good content because there, there is so much bad content out of there for every, good article on because stoicism is like the hottest game in town for the last 10 years in terms of you know ancient philosophies that have been uh, popular recently for every like one good article there's probably 10 crappy uh, you know like some guy who wants to make a buck by putting together a listicle things out there so you gotta mm -hmm. you gotta be kind of you gotta know a little bit in order to be able to recognize the good stuff from the bad stuff that is a big challenge um, I think there's some problems too, though, that the internet introduces that ancient philosophy or, you know, thing, the practices drawn from others can be helpful with, you know, our, our attention span hasn't just by the technology existing been affected, but it, it is easy to get into these patterns where you're, you know, checking your phone and, and like Twitter, Twitter, for example, right? Checking the Twitter app, you posted something funny about ancient philosophy. I gotta see if anybody's responding to it, right? Um, it's easy to get stuck in these loops where, where new habits can get formed and they're not always good habits. Um, and, and, but we have a lot of resources to help us with that, I think. Um, what else? Uh, I'm trying to think of if I've left anything out of what you're asking me about. Um, well, I think the, the what you mentioned about stoicism is interesting because I think it shows how one, that there's tremendous interest in ancient philosophies and there's tremendous yeah, practical yeah. value to them. But then there's a the question of um, how do we incorporate those ideas and, and worldviews? You know, there's a lot of discussion. Oh, you know, right. We, we've even yeah. hosted, we've even hosted on, um, on the side view of, you know, some articles that I've, help publish, you know, just on this debate over how much of stoicism can be brought into a modern scientific context. And, yeah. you know, is, uh, is stoic theology, for example, or stoic pantheism, like a necessary feature of stoicism today? Is it still yeah. stoicism or does it do the, does the, does the metaphysical commitment represent some important aspect of, uh, the philosophy and the, the practice or, um, can you get away with, as you say, kind of abstracting, like, you know, little life hacks. I, I have pretty strong opinions about doing that, but it all, it's also yeah. clear that, you know, we should update certain aspects of our philosophies as we understand things certain, uh, you know, better. So there, there's a tension there, right? And so where there is, 
where do you come in on um, those kinds of questions? Um, let me let me answer this with sort of a, a specific example, and then talk a little bit more generally about it. So, so I was going to say there are traditional Stoics out there, and they're organized, and they call themselves traditional Stoics, and they have a college of Stoic philosophers where you can actually get ordained. And in their view, nobody who calls themselves a modern Stoic is a Stoic. So they're sort of like the Orthodox Stoics that we we don't actually know that much about who condemned, you know, Panatius and Posidonius and said, oh, they're not real Stoics, you know, uh, back in the past, because they thought maybe you should reincorporate some things from Aristotle or Plato that they, they got right, you know. Um, and they are definitely committed to, if you don't buy into the, you know, the, the universe is organized according to a providential, you know, logos and all that, you're not a real Stoic. And Fortunately, they're, they're a small minority, but they are a very vocal one. And we actually had one of them come to our uh, local Stoic Fellowship meeting and um, harangue us a bit um, for, for not being properly Stoic. Um, so you can find that in every, every movement, I think. You can find sure. people on the uh, you know, Facebook uh, Kuno Sarges uh, group criticizing each other for not being adequately cynic enough, you know, not being faithful enough to the thing. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the Stoic tradition, and I think you can say this about any any healthy tradition, and this is again a point that's that's sort of taken from McIntyre, is going to be adapting itself to whatever else it's it's running into, you know. Um, and if that means that you know our, our sense of the universe has changed, or you know, if if, if you're an Aristotelian, you don't have to buy into Aristotle's physics. <laughs> It'd be crazy to, right? Um, you can adopt a lot of things and then take what's really important from the philosophy, and it can still be very substantive. You know, right. usually that tends to be the ethical stuff. But there, there's even with the ethical stuff, there's some things where we're like, yeah, I think we need to rethink this. So in Stoicism, a uh, prime example of this, you know, with with Zeno, with Musonius Rufus, it's very clear that men and women have the same capacities, should be educated in virtue in the same ways um, with Epictetus. If, if you're you know, a guy and you don't have a beard, uh, fortunately, both of us do, you're not really a guy and you're, you're being <laughs> effeminate. And, and so when you read stuff like that, you're like, oh, come on. Right. You know, um, we, we, this stuff we're going we're gonna to either just get rid of or we're going to attenuate in some way. And I think there's a good bit of that in every single tradition. Yeah. Look at. yeah. So the question then is, well, how do we sort these things out, you know, and part of it is uh, maybe we do it as a community, you know, maybe we bounce these ideas back and forth and we say, do we really need this bit over here? You know, I mean, I, I could see how this would be appealing to those. We, we actually have a name for them. Broics. They're not real Stoics. They're the, the hyper, you know, uh, weird conception of masculinity in, in, you know, only courage matters, not justice, wisdom, temperance. Um, they love that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So so they're 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 not going to be good deciders about that. But the mainstream, you know, we can say, yeah, this will will keep this. This will will have to update or, or reject. And, and that's that, that's been part of the way the Stoics approach things. You know, Zeno himself was taking stuff from three different philosophical schools, bringing it together, uh, deriving a new synthesis of his own. He had offshoots that were kind of dead ends, like this guy, Aristo, you know, uh, then there's a progression. And in that progression, they're adding new doctrines, thinking things through. By the time that we get to Seneca, he's even willing to take stuff from Epicureans who are like, you know, the big baddies for the Stoics, you know, it's almost hard to be worse than an Epicurean. Seneca is willing to say, if they've got something good, we're going to, we're going to take it. Right. So, so long as you've got a coherent um, like I said, network of, of ideas that are systematized, it can change over time. Right. You right. know, it can adapt. W what you talked about is like the life hack stuff. That's problematic. I, I think that when you take a philosophy and you're just going to like cut it into a whole bunch of little pieces and put it out, you know, on display, um, you're losing a lot of what it, what it was going to provide you with. So all those articles about, you know, 10 stoic life hacks to help you deal with stress, they will help you a bit. They're not going to help you remotely like actually mm -hmm. studying stoicism would, or, or Epicureanism or pick whatever you like, right? Um, 
Yeah, so it seems like there's a, there's a sort of classic tension there between conserving tradition and yeah. conserving the healthy aspect of the tradition yeah. and uh, a, a kind of a progressivism and emphasis on change or an emphasis on just sort of you know creating a a sort of utilitarian kind of pick and pull out of traditions you can just kind of take what you want and it seems like if you go too far in either direction then then you're not going to have a very stable experience stable line, lineage the practice might not deliver yeah. in the way that it's that it's supposed to and then so, like I you mean, said can, yeah how do you how do you where's that line how do you make that judgment and you're probably right that it has to be done in community in sort of public discussion where yeah you know multiple perspectives can be kind of heard and 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 judged and synthesized maybe in a different way yeah even within like the modern stoicism organization um we have several of us like myself who are not stoics but eclectics you know, I'm, I'm a Ciceronian eclectic where um, I think there's a lot of great stuff to Stoicism. I think there's a lot of great stuff to the Aristotelian and Platonic tradition. I think there's great stuff from the existentialists. And, you know, I try to bring the best of them together. And there's, there's several of us like that. And then there's others who are committed Stoics, you know, with a capital S. And they differ on, on who we should emphasize more. Like, you know, uh, Donald Robertson um, is rather suspicious of Seneca. He thinks that Seneca's kind of lax in a lot of respects. Right. Massimo Pigliucci, big fan of Seneca, you know. So there can there can be important distinctions even within uh, the same the same sure, group. Sure. You know? And then you start to see how much psychological temperament and and personality yeah. you know yeah. gets into this. And I was even thinking about that as you were mentioning the uh, the Broics who just emphasize like certain certain strands of a tradition and not not the others on the yeah. one hand that's a shame on the other it's probably clearly part of that person's sort of developmental arc and so like a good yeah. in my view a good healthy tradition uh a good healthy living tradition would spot people like that and if they're willing to participate they would have things to say to them they would have practices that they could engage in that would kind of give them that you know more, I don't know, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, even, even attitude that, that included, I, I think that's justice completely and right. Yeah. And things like that. And I, yeah. I, that's one of the reasons I'm interested in this conversation about the internet and can it, can it become a place of not just sort of distribution and communication, but actual development, you know, and, I'm thinking about this, especially in the context of, of losing some of these other institutions, yeah, yeah. The, the places where those traditions could thrive and develop into sort of um, multi-generational places. Do you think we could use the internet in some way like that? So that um, you actually, instead of just having like YouTube videos, like m maybe you can actually create something like a curriculum. Maybe it doesn't have an accredited degree attached to it. Well, I've, yeah, we've done that with Reason IO, right? Or is that what you? Yeah, tried to well, do? And, and quite a few people have done similar things. Um, yeah, there's things like that out there. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> you know, one of the things that comes to mind right off the bat when we're talking about using using the internet to do something more than just have content, you know, out there. Um, we have to be very careful about the fact that we're heavily beholden to big tech companies that, that um, you know, I don't think they're diabolical or anything like that, but they certainly, you know, they're, they're mainly in it to make a buck. And then they all have an interest in like dominating everything that they can with the big five, like Amazon, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Apple, and, and Google. Each one of them has these totalizing pretensions, like we're going to offer every single thing for your, for your life. And from the perspective of a, you know, ancient philosophy, we should be distrustful of all of them. And yet, if we want to use the internet effectively, we're kind of stuck with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like we were talking about how to edit things beforehand. I use iMovie. You use iMovie. That's an Apple product. You know, right. I, I write in Microsoft Word. Um, I have Amazon links in my, my YouTube videos. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think I get away from any of the, uh, the big companies. Um, and, and, you know, they keep on buying up new, new portions of the internet. So LinkedIn yeah. is owned by Microsoft and Skype is, um, I don't know if Zoom is still independent, right? Um, as far as we know. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. But, but if they get big enough, somebody will gobble them up. Well, and so we, we do have to be attentive to that. Thing. Right. Well, you get these, um, you get all these like sort of first mover advantages that create these weird centralization dynamics. Oh, so I mean, right. Right. Yeah, so you yeah. get, um, you know, zoom, you know, we were using zoom at, at, at work and for various things, but in kind of specific contexts, you know, and then the pandemic hit and now all of a sudden yeah. everybody's using zoom for everything. But there's a question there. Why are we all using zoom? And the answer is it happened to be there. You know, it happened yeah. to be, the product that was there. And now because everybody's using it, like the number of times that people are willing to switch from one program to another is almost never. Once you have it, <laughs> yeah. once you, it's, it's Microsoft Word isn't a great writing program. It's just yeah. what people have on their desktop. So you get, you get those, um, those weird dynamics. And then that creates, um, it creates uniformity in, in practices and what you can do just because the platform is the same, you know? And so now we're all interacting on Twitter for better or worse, you know, and we're, yeah. how do things circulate on Twitter? Well, they have these algorithms that, you know, prioritize certain kinds of content over other content. And you want to be there because clearly the advantages are still greater than the disadvantages. But um, I have questions like that myself where I have to, I have to question what am I participating in and, what is that doing to me? You mentioned the, the there's an addictive quality to um, the apps, and they're designed that way. They're designed to take advantage of certain aspects of your psychology so that you use them more. And so I think, you know, in this context of, you know, doing philosophy as a way of life, um, how does that feed into what's happening on the internet? Or is the drive to kind of create content its own, um, its own end? You know, or I'm just trying yeah, to yeah. like conceptualize, like keeping the goal in mind. Like, what's what's what are you actually trying to do with what you're well, producing? You know, that's that's a great set of questions, and I, I, I there isn't like one single overarching telos I would say in most cases, but there's a lot of there's a lot of things where we could be prioritizing it, and where it would it would require us to do um, our decision making differently. So depending on what we're, we're actually willing to, to buy into. Um, if, you know, if the goal of philosophy as a way of life is transformation of the self, uh, and as, uh, this is one of the things I do like about Foucault's article or piece, Technologies mm -hmm. of the Self, he's, he says it's not like for any telos whatsoever, right? He doesn't say, so you can be super successful in the workplace and resilient when your employer kicks you around, right? Mm -hmm. He says, there's, there's these things that were traditionally viewed as proper teloe for, te, tele rather, for um, philosophies as a, as a way of life or, or technologies of the self. You know, like um, some of them could be kind of, you know, religious in, in mind, like uh, salvation. Some of them could be about having freedom. Some of them could be about, you know, reaching the, the whatever it is to be a fully developed human being. I think we have to have those sort of things in mind and not just as like buzzwords or kind of, you know, cookie cutter images, but, you know, real substantive things. Yeah. And we can ask ourselves, okay, is Apple and my engagement with it, is that being furthered by this or is it being hindered by it? And, and we'd have to get kind of, as they say, granular, meaning, you know, get down to the particulars. Mm -hmm. um, it might be that some are worse than others, you know, um, maybe, Maybe uh, Facebook and Google and Amazon are worse than Microsoft and Apple. I don't really know, you know, right, right. Um, but we'd, we'd have to like explore those things and then make decisions where it actually counts, mm -hmm. where it hurts oftentimes mm -hmm. uh, to do that. So, you know, a good example of this is, well, what kind of, what kind of videos are you going to make? Um, and for me, it was kind of a, it was a temperamental thing. I don't, I don't like glitzy videos where, it's five minutes and it's some guy, you know, in, in kind of a used car salesman voice telling me about what Hume thought and not communicating anything, but having a lot of graphics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'd prefer to watch somebody in front of a chalkboard who knows what they're talking about, even yeah. if they're a little bit dry and, you know, the lighting isn't perfect. Right. Um, and so for me, it was kind of a natural to go low tech, high content. But I think for a lot of people, that would be a deliberate decision, you know. Because what does YouTube reward? It it isn't you know, doing 
doing things the way right. I'm doing them. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of other, I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to be right. kind of a, a jerk about it, but there's a lot of uh, YouTubers out there doing stuff on philosophy where they're getting way more views and subscribers um, and actually making enough revenue where they could like actually be full-time YouTubers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's because they figured out that that's what the algorithm uh, requires. But by, by doing philosophy in that way, and by putting that forth as the model for how to understand philosophy, I think they're doing a disservice. Yeah, it becomes self-defeating almost. Yeah, yeah. What was the phrase you used? Low tech, high content? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I like that's, that phrase. That's how I describe what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah I was, I was Low talking... production is all another way to talk about it, right? Right. No, but I mean, there's, there's a reason that the, the lecture format is thousands of years old. You know, it's... It, it's effective. Yeah. And there's, there's something durable about it. And it's, it has survived so many other changing contexts, you know, that there's a good likelihood that it will also survive this changing context. You know, when, when, uh, so in, in the early 2010s, there was all this stuff about, oh, lecture is dead. Chalk and talk is dead. Don't inflict that on your students. It all, it all has to be active learning. And so I, I didn't buy into it, but I was like, I'll experiment with this, you know? And I would do classes where it was very little lecture and, um, you know, flip classroom, do some videos and stuff like that. And eventually the students, and these were like, you know, 18 to 24 year olds, they'd be like, when are you actually going to lecture? We're paying you because, you know, we're not looking for somebody to like guide us in group exercises you you know about this stuff. When are you actually going to get in front of the chalkboard and talk about the stuff and help us understand it? So so there is this an interesting pushback from the very audience who we'd been all told that you know they don't want that sort of stuff. Now of course that's an anecdote, so we can't right, we can't draw right. too much from yeah. it. But you know, I no, mean, but there's something what do you there. Think? Yeah, there's something there, and I think that's the same. Uh... That's the same conclusion I sort of draw from just the fact that there is lively discussion and exchange on the internet about fairly dense topics, you know, from people who aren't going to grad school, from people who aren't even going to study philosophy as an undergrad, you know, there's yeah. still that interest in it. Um, and we, we can create spaces where that, um, those kinds of conversations can happen in better and worse ways, you know. And so I'm very yeah, interested yeah. in kind of participating in, in how to unfold that into its next stages. You know, if we've kind of, if we've kind of got distribution and communication and, and publishing kind of down, you know, that's fairly easy to do. Uh, yeah. What's, what's sort of the next, the next set of structures that we could put online um, to kind of complement or maybe even run parallel to the traditional institutions, which, you know, we started the show with, with saying that there are some real deficiencies there and those deficiencies, you know, that's like, you know, trying to turn this battle cruiser around. It's not, it's not <laughs> going to happen quickly yeah. or anytime soon. So meanwhile, we have, we have all of this creativity and we have all of this sort of cognitive energy available from, you know, the increasing number of PhDs who are adjuncts or who just won't get jobs. What happens to all of that? something you know we can create maybe alternate systems that um keep those modes of thinking alive and so maybe yeah and and in that sense recovering some of that ancient sense of philosophy which to me you know it's not that it didn't look like modern university systems in terms of content alone but also in terms of like structures you know um Peter Lindbergh. Do you know Peter yeah. Lindbergh? I do, the, indeed. He's, yeah, he's yeah. got the Stoa. You know his little online space named mm -hmm. after the you know the physical Stoa. That's not a university. You know either the the actual Greek structure or what he's doing online, but he's creating a space where mm -hmm. communities can form and discuss. And that format, that medium, has more in common with the ancient you know system of philosophical schools. Than the modern credential system does. Yeah. So it's not like, it's not like philosophy depends on universities. It's sometimes it's lived in universities and sometimes it hasn't. You know. And yeah. So if your concern is to keep philosophy going, then the fact that the university system is is kind of in a state of disarray shouldn't be immediate cause for 
concern necessarily because the philosophy came before it and will probably outlive it, you know, is my view at least. Yeah, it, it depends on the, the kind of philosophy we're talking about, right? So sure. I think that <clears throat> um, the two predominant modes and, and sort of um, sets of traditions that we typically associate with academic philosophy today, analytic and continental philosophy, um, they're not that adaptable to, mm. to this, this new system. I mean, if you, if you have to tell somebody, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in this, this one thing here, and in order to get into my conversation, you need to read these eight articles that came out between these years, you know, or, or you have to, you know, f- get these, these texts and, you know, read them and sort of buy into whatever the author happens to say, even though it seems like nonsense, um, that's not really going to fly. You know, you got to be able to provide value up front, you might say, to people who would, who would get involved with it. And I, I think a lot of academic philosophers are not, not used to doing that because they're part of what you, you, you mm-hmm. identified as this credentialing system where you, you get your PhD and then you walk into the classroom and now you're the expert and they have to kind of adapt themselves to you rather than you adapting yourself to, to the audience, which is just good rhetoric, by the way. I mean, again, right. it's something Aristotle and Cicero right. and all people were like Descartes were attentive to, you know, Descartes yeah. is a, ma- a master rhetorician. Um, and the, you know, the other thing too, philosophers uh, throughout history, many of them have had day jobs. Sure. You know, and, and so that is kind of the model, you know, even Descartes, who was kind of independently wealthy, you know, he worked as a tutor and he was a soldier for a while. And, you know, he actually did work in a university for a short time, but not, not all that long, sure. you know, um, there's this sense among, and I actually would be interested to get your take on this. So there's this sense among, um, people who have PhDs that if you're not getting a tenure track job, you're, you're a loser, you failed. And, it, and it's such a, you know, skewed system. You know, the tenure track jobs are going mostly to those who are from elite universities because there's less of them and there's, you know, all that prestige associated with it. So like Marquette University, for example, right down the road, when I was a grad student, they had like a 90% placement rate. You know, if you went to Marquette, you were getting a job. Wow. It wouldn't be at Harvard. It would be at some four, you know, four-year liberal arts school or a big state school, but you were going to do okay. Um, now they're having trouble placing their grad students because there aren't that many jobs and they're, they're not a top tier school. And there's this sense that like, if you step outside of traditional academia, if you don't like sign on as an adjunct or be willing to move, you know, for a two-year position, you know, and drag your family all over the place and then do the next one and the next one, um, you're somehow like selling out, you're disappointing your, your advisors and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're, I, I see a lot of anguish produced by all of that. And I think that, um, you know, if we looked at the history of philosophy, I think we could say um, this doesn't have to be the norm, right. you know, um, anybody should be able to do whatever they want with their PhD. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be chasing that, that, you know, brass ring, um, which who knows how many of them there's still left. Right. No, I mean, I came in far enough down the line where I basically just started, I came in assuming that a university job wasn't going to be what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, I'm also a person who likes jobs and needs jobs. Um, Yeah. So from that perspective, did you, did you get a hard time from any of your professors or fellow students for having that point of view? No, not, not so much. That's good. Yeah, not so much. And I think it's just, I mean, if you look, the, the numbers are, are so bad right now. And <laughs> um, the idea of just adjunct teaching doesn't, doesn't sound uh, that compelling to me in most of the contexts that it's available. But like I said, you know, jobs are jobs. And, you know, um, that's an important thing to think about. And sometimes when I hear people talk about you know, people giving up or people, you know, going in a different direction, I have to wonder, like, what is the economic position of the people who make those criticisms? You know, if you're like me, and you have, you have student loans, and, you know, you kind of need to get to work right away. And, you know, you can't mess around too much about, you know, your ideal thing, you kind of watch those conversations go by just thinking, like, 
well, what, what would, what do you, what do you suggest I do? You know, I, something needs to happen now. So I think there's yeah. more of a sense that, um, you're going to, you're going to create, and this is true. I think not just of academics, this is kind of a shift in the workplace in general. You're going to do multiple different things in multiple different spaces. And those things are going to ch- tend to change over time. So coming up with some like core skills that transfer into different areas is, yeah. is kind of how I've set it up. And then, you know, doing stuff like this, having these conversations, thinking about how can I get a little bit of funding to, you know, run the side view and run the podcast and publish a journal and things like that. So yeah, you, yeah. Keep, you keep these different lanes open, you know, but yeah, I don't know how it places it, how... a much greater stress on your own agency rather than like waiting for somebody else to, you know, put you in the slot, so to speak. And, yeah. and I think a lot of academics are very used to like, well, I, I, you know, they're sort of like, um, the old corporate types, right? Sure. I just do my job here and eventually they'll put, they'll take me out of the cubicle and they'll put me in a nice office and mm-hmm. it won't be the corner office, but you know, maybe, you know, 30 years down the line before I get my, um, uh, you know, retirement party, I'll get one of those corner mm-hmm. offices and, and, you know, staff working for me. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's kind of a prevailing thing among a lot of academics. They're, they're quite passive. Yeah. And that, I was actually thinking about that as you were speaking about rhetoric just now, that I've actually had experiences, you know, working with writers, like help, helping to publish articles on the website that yeah. sometimes it's more difficult to get the PhD to write for a broader audience than the person without a degree. Um, and the same thing, you know, giving just speaking online, doing podcasts, things like this, there's a, there's a different style of speaking that I think, I think we could do more if you wanted to do something for academics in terms of their training, get them used to kind of writing in that mode, get them used to kind of speaking to more diverse audiences um, and, and have them practice that because that's probably going to be a part of what they do, you know, and that's probably for the good, just in terms of creating a, you know, the United States right now doesn't really have, hasn't really had for most of my life, an active public intellectual uh, culture, really. Yeah. Um, which, I'm kind of smiling because I, on the one hand, I did the right thing. And on the other hand, I did the wrong thing. So, you know, like, obviously my YouTube videos, I talk like an ordinary person most of the time, right? I right. sometimes use big words, but I'm, I, you know, I, I, I grew up uh, in essentially a family of tradespeople, and, you know, I didn't go to any fancy schools. So, you know, that, that was actually very helpful for me. Mm-hmm. When it came to my writing, I have a blog or Exus DNO Etique. I've had it for over 10 years. And five years ago, one of my high school friends said, you know, Greg could really get a lot more readers if he didn't write these overly long, complex paragraphs and just wrote like an ordinary person. And I resisted (laughs) because, because, you know, in in my reading stuff, you know, I I was reading complex things and I wanted to write the way I wanted to write. And I wasn't, I wasn't making any money on the blog or anything. So I was like, nobody's going to tell me how to do it. And, you know, it's got, very few readers. So the YouTube stuff gets a lot of watchers because I'll, you know, talk the way I'm talking here. Yeah. Uh, I don't write that way. You know, I've, I've changed it. Like when I write on medium, I, I'm, you know, writing in, in more mm-hmm. simple form. Right. Uh, so I finally learned the lesson, but you know, sometimes... well, it's, it's, it's its own skill. And in a lot of ways, oh, yeah. in a lot of ways, it's harder. It's not dumbing it down, which is how it's often framed. Right? right. And sometimes I think it's just about, you know, if you have to use a technical term just to remember that it is a technical term that other people aren't going to be familiar with. And it's not the word itself that anybody yeah. has trouble with. It's the fact that you need to explain what a non-ordinary word means. And that doing that in a half a sentence or, you know, just on the flies is, is very difficult. And I think it's because of what you said earlier that um, if you're speaking to a group of grad students or people who work in your field, so much of that becomes implicit yeah, and yeah. it under-examined. And then somebody says like, well, what do you mean by that? And people get stumped and they kind of sit there and they say, oh, actually, I'm not <laughs> quite sure I know what I mean by that. Hold on. Let me, let me think about that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Well, um, I think we're reaching about the end of our time here, but maybe if there's anything that you're currently working on or just want to share with the audience, any last thoughts, um, as well as of course, you know, where they can find you I'll I'll include some links in the notes, but you know, best ways to get involved with what you're doing and, you know, just follow on with your work. 
Yeah, I mean, the YouTube channel, um, I've got a Facebook author page where I put events. They can also find it on like Reason.io's uh, event calendar as well. I do a lot of online stuff. I mean, in the time of COVID, everything's online, right? So I don't do any face-to-face -face stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always got a whole bunch of irons in the fire, you know? So right now I'm working mm -hmm. on two different academic papers, one for the St. Anselm Conference, which is coming up in April. And then I've got a, a paper I'm writing with a friend of mine from the University of Oslo about um, Aristotle, Epictetus, uh, Alexander of Aphrodisius, and Simplicius on, you know, the faculty of choice. But there's there's always all sorts of other things. I'm churning out content on on YouTube, and um, so it's very difficult for me to say like, you know, this is the one single project I'm 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 working on. Um, I, I will say this that having multiple projects often means that everything takes way longer than it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with that. Mm -hmm. yep. So, but I mean, final thoughts, you know, this, this whole idea of philosophy as a way of life, I think maybe the, it being a philosophy part sometimes intimidates people um, and maybe discourages them from wanting to try it out. But I, I think it, it really is philosophy for everybody. You know, you don't have to, have majored in philosophy as an undergrad to be able to read Ado and then go from Ado to say reading Plato or, or whoever else, you know, draws you in it, this, this sort of stuff is our, our cultural heritage. And I, and I don't mean that in sort of like an ethnocentric sort of way. I mean, like a whole, I mean it in a humanistic way, all, all this stuff is for all of us, you know? Yeah. And so, it, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody can get it right away, but, nobody should feel like there's some sort of closed off preserve of philosophy that they're not, they're not able to go into. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and coming on and letting us know. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Doing. This is a yeah. great conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it.